The symptoms of people with an amputated extremity show how the brain is surprisingly conscious of the body. These people complain of pain in this non-existent extremity, which is also known as a phantom limb. Each part of the body is linked to a specific region of the brain, which processes information transmitted through the corresponding nervous branches. When a limb is amputated, the part of the brain associated with this limb stops receiving nervous information, which provokes a curious readjustment. The cerebral region that is located next to it absorbs the region of the amputated limb. If this correspondence existed, for example, in the cheeks, every time a person were to smile, the neurons of the amputated limb would be stimulated, causing the patient to think that the limb really existed. The patient, however, has the sensation that this limb is simply paralyzed and hurts when he tries to move it. The treatment to overcome these sensations is convincing the brain and the associated neurons that this non-existent extremity is not paralyzed but gone. So, I was wondering if there is some way you can get them to move their phantom. Maybe that would relieve the pains, at least in some cases. So we hit on the technique of putting a mirror in front of the patient, like that, you know, sort of like that, on the table, and put the phantom on the left side of the mirror, and the real hand mimicking the position of the phantom, exactly. And then if the person looks into the shiny side of the mirror at the reflection of the normal hand, it looks like the phantom has come back. And then you ask him to start moving his normal hand. He gets the vivid visual illusion that the phantom is also moving. And in some cases, this seems to relieve the painful cramping sensation in the phantom arm. Now, this needs to be evaluated using double-blind clinical trials. That hasn't been done yet. But we have had success, success with many patients who take the mirror home, practice with it, and say, now they can move their uh, phantom hand somehow the mirror mobilizes the phantom and this alleviates the pain. The strange and complex functionality of the brain becomes a greater challenge for the scientific mind when entering the dark field of mental illness, an area where normal brain functions, as we know them, stop working. These images show the pathological changes of a brain suffering from Alzheimer's disease, one of the illnesses of our time related to memory and aging. The size and capacities of the brain have decreased due to the illness. As with almost all mental illnesses, the most serious effects are expressed in alterations of consciousness. Patients with Alzheimer's slowly lose their memory, as well as their personality, their identity, and their perceptions as individuals. Submerged in a mental black hole, the patient does not even realize that he is participating in life. Life is nothing more than a vegetative state. Insanity, the abstract term that describes profound mental illnesses, marks a frontier beyond which the consciousness of an individual dissolves. Brain dysfunction is such that the brain is not even able to organize the reception of information. Millions of facts and stimuli accumulate upon entering the brain, which registers them and mixes them up chaotically. As a result, the individual loses himself and loses his basic reference points, 
without being able to distinguish his internal sensations and his own voices from external signals. Neurological research aspires to understand and dominate the brain, like any other human organ. And only with this knowledge will the great dream of consciousness become possible, the control of our minds. Will man ever reach a new cerebral stage? It's amazing we know much more about color vision. We've studied it for 100 years. We know all the laws of color vision. We know what parts of the eye are involved, what the cells are doing, what the pigments are doing, what parts of the brain are involved, V4 in the fusiform gyrus, the thin stripes, the blobs in area 18. We know all of that. But if you ask about what is love, what is jealousy, what is ambition, we have no idea other than what anybody on the street can tell you. But all of this is happening in here in your brain. And that's going to certainly going to involve a knowledge of neurochemistry because we know that chemicals can profoundly influence mood and emotion. According to scientific research, everything that takes place in the brain is in essence physical and chemical. Therefore, if the mysteries of the cerebral laboratory were revealed, man would be able to control his state of mind as he desires, thanks to medication. Today, this hypothetical chemical well-being is already being experienced through the use of certain medications, like the latest antidepressants, which have become a sociological phenomenon. For psychiatrists and psychologists, however, the reason behind human unhappiness is not always biological, genetic, or derived from a cerebral chemical. The past, the environment, or the type of personality can be the origin of a chronic depression for which medication is used to alleviate the symptoms and not as a solution to the problem. On the other hand, if pleasure could be provoked in a continuous and stable manner, and if pain could be eliminated, where would we place the frontier between desirable well-being and an insensitive state of mind? To respond to this question, and so many others related to the mechanisms of the mind, brain scientists at this time can only offer partial answers according to their field, whether biological, chemical, or psychological. The brain is the greatest challenge that science faces since we know very little about the governing organ of human beings. In other words, the organ that governs us. Neuroscience is certainly in lack of uh, new unifying theories. Um, I think we all sense this. Uh, we have a disproportionate amount of data uh, relative to the theories we have. Uh, so it's not like in physics where theory um, advances and then produces um, a flood of data, but then is unified again. Neuroscience is the science that has grown the fastest over the last decades, recruits more and more people and enters more and more neighboring domains. It, it touches in, onto philosophy, um, it touches of course onto the social sciences because it's the brain that produces the behavior which the social scientists analyze. Uh, so it is the science of the natural sciences that has most contacts to the humanities and this will also make it grow because there will be interdisciplinary adventures on the borders.